Hey everyone, this video is from a talk I gave to the students at South West College in Northern Ireland earlier this year. It covers the second UV channel workflow and how to use it to give your assets some extra detail using custom masks. I used this heavily during the creation of my most recent scene, No Honor in Fire, which you can see on screen now. At the time of recording, this scene was at an extremely early stage, so most of the assets you will see are a work in progress but I felt that this method really helped me ground my assets and add extra storytelling to them. In this talk, I cover the basics of this workflow in detail, from the UV unwrap stage to mask creation, all the way up to setting up the shader in engine. This was recorded live on Discord due to COVID-19, but I think it may be useful to some despite its unedited nature. That's all from me, hope you enjoy the video. Cool, sounds good. Uh, first of all, thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, what's up, everybody? My name is Cairo. Uh, I'm currently an outsource artist working on a couple of projects I'm not really allowed to talk about at the moment. Um, and I'm from South Africa, so please excuse the weird accent. Um, so basically, yeah, like Paul said, I thought it would be um, useful just to go through one of these modular assets that makes up one of the buildings in my scene at the moment, uh, sort of from the UV unwrap stage in your modeling package, all the way through to UE4, just to get a better idea of how to set this all up. So uh, let's get started. So I thought this asset's probably easiest to go through just because it's not too complex and it's sort of big. So hopefully it'll be easier for you guys to see what I'm doing. Um, so basically, as the name implies, uh, you're going to be setting up a second UV channel inside your mesh so that you can have either a trim or a tileable inside your first UV channel and inside your second UV channel, you're going to have a unique unwrap inside the zero to one space, which you can then use to layer masks inside Unreal Engine using the different masks generated in Painter. So, um, just to talk a little bit about the uh, trim we're using over here. So just something to keep in mind when you're creating trims and stuff like that. I'm sure you guys have done this to death by now. But um, just because I know that my scene is a lot of, you know, wood and thatch and stuff like that. Obviously, that's what the majority of my trim is going to be. Uh, in also including rope and some wood damage, uh, log ends, stuff like that. Uh, you can see that this is still little bit work in progress so the nice thing about the second uv workflow is that you're basically maintaining the textile density of your trim sheet or your tileable while using these masks to sort of accentuate um, your asset so like i said you basically just model whatever you're trying to do and then you just map this these uv shells to your trim and then that's basically the first part done. That's your first UV, that's what you should be familiar with. So now the unique part comes in by just doing something like this. So first of all, um, just to go back to the trim quickly. Uh, so like I said, this trim is just a 2K texture and I'm using a 512 texel density for this scene. So if you're using some type of textile density checker inside your modeling package, just make sure to set every, everything to the correct scale so that everything works nicely across your scene. Then for the unique, things get a little bit different because obviously we're not maintaining that textile density. So I think for something like this, it's something like 1.4. So it's a bit of a, a rule of thumb at the moment, but I've kind of been playing with a few of these assets and just uh, producing the mask to different qualities, texture resolutions, just to see which is the most effective. And I've noticed that at about quarter res of whatever your textile density for the trim is, so in this case 512, you can sort of get away with that. So anything around 1.28 is going to be pretty much fine. Uh, in some instances with large assets, you can go lower. So you really don't need to worry about the textile density inside you, your unique UV unwrap. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
basically what I did for this is I just duplicated the trim UV channel into this one and just did a quick and dirty auto pack of these islands. And I made sure to leave the rotate option off for this mask purely because uh, we're working with a material like wood, which in and of itself is kind of like extremely directional you know you've got wood grain that always follows one direction and stuff like that so i just wanted to make my life when creating masks a little bit easier so that if i want uh, some type of mask that follows the wood grain i don't need to worry about triplanar or anything like that you can just do a straight uh, uv projection for that uh, you might be wondering why my unique UV unwrap is inside the first UV channel as opposed to the second. That's purely because at the moment, Pater doesn't have the functionality for multiple UV channels. So basically it discards every other UV channel after the first one. So because we want to texture the unique unwrap, obviously, uh, I just put that in the first UV channel. <clears throat> In UV4, it doesn't really matter which way you set this around because you can just change this around with a texture coordinate node. So after you've done all of that, mapped your trim, done your unique UV unwrap, you can just export that to UE4, and then we can also start generating masks inside Painter. So um, just to talk a little bit about my logic behind the mask creation and stuff like that, so I know I wanted color variation to the wood so that the tileables wouldn't be as uh, sort of flat and repetitive as they are. Uh, I knew I wanted dirt to collect in the crevices of the meshes and it sort of had to make sense for each individual mesh. It had to be like context, context specific. And then I wanted wetness and moss because of course uh, I'm working on a pretty swampy environment so those sort of go with the territory. Um, so first of all, this is, we're obviously using a very trim dependent workflow here and tileables and stuff like that. So there's not much high poly going into this, but we still want to use generators and stuff like that, which are going to have to use curvature and AO and stuff like that. So first of all, whenever I'm working on an asset like this, I'll just bake mesh maps using the low poly mesh as the high poly mesh. So you just bump up the resolution. I don't have any material IDs and just bump up the anti-aliasing and just bake your mesh maps. And then you can use all the fancy generators that come with substance. So I uh, don't want to spend too long on this, but just to quickly go through how I would go about creating each mask. I'm sure you guys have done this plenty of times. Um, so for the color variation, first of all, as I said, wood is very directional. The grain only goes one way. Anything that sort of deviates from that is going to look a little bit strange. So luckily, Substance has this wood grayscale, which is just multiplied with the normal clouds just so that it's not applied everywhere. I like to blur most of these RGBA masks just so that they aren't so dependent on the resolution. The blurring just helps that a little bit. And then you'll notice if I turn off this paint subtract over here unfortunately the floaters are also the floating geometry rather i should say um, are also receiving all of these masks and i don't particularly want so in this case um, if you look at blender those areas over here are just my wood damages and stuff and they don't particularly need masks unless i really want it so you can just turn off basically everything that's affecting the floaters over there so dirt's going to be an important one inside the scene because if I hop back into Unreal quickly, I just go into Unlit. I think the dirt is really what pushes the second UV workflow over here. So if I turn off all my masks over here, you can see that with just the base trim and uh, just the floaters and the multiple tileables over here, it looks pretty flat. There is some variation due to the color variation inside the trim, but it's really the masks that bring this together. So you can see the dirt that collects in all the crevices over there it just works really well. So I think the dirt is the one you should probably spend the most time on. 
to make sure that your asset is like really, really grounded. So because of those uh, mesh maps that I baked, I can just use this uh, generic mask builder. I'm sure you guys have seen it tons of times before. So one thing to keep in mind, again, with the floating geometry, if you're using that workflow, if you're not, don't really worry about it is that especially this mask builder, the legacy one, uh, it's very dependent on AO. So if you are going to bake your, bake your low poly with itself, the, the baker is going to think that the floaters are occluding your other geometry. So it's going to cast ambient occlusion over there. And then you're going to get dirt in a very weird straight line under your floating geo over there. So it's just quick to paint it out really quickly, really dirty, doesn't have to be anything um, fancy, literally just with the default brush. And then um, the reason why there's a second dirt mask over here is because, like I said with this generator, it's kind of, um, it's not great, it's, taking scale of things into account so by the time that this gets to an appropriate level when you bump this up it's sort of blown out these smaller pieces over here so if you if i just enable this over here pretty much exactly the same thing with the mask builder but just at a smaller level just so that i can have finer control over those small areas over there so i think i just decreased the ao and the curvature and that really makes a big difference because preferably you don't want your mask to completely cover any of your assets because then in engine you're just going to get solid flat colors which doesn't look extremely realistic or grounded so try to avoid that as much as possible and then let's move on to wetness quickly so this is the one that you can kind of play around with a little bit because obviously where water gathers and drips and stuff like that is very situational so for lots of my assets which are more flat obviously they would be receiving water from above from rainfall and from below from the swampy environment stuff like that so for this wall in particular i know that it's sort of uh, propped up on these struts, so it's not going to get a huge amount of water all over, and it's also covered by the roof. However, um, because it's you know a very moist, water-filled environment, there is going to be some moisture to speak of, so there will be some sort of uh, water saturation from the wood coming up from the ground, and then also from quite a mossy, damp uh, thatch roof. There's also going to be some over there. I mean, as long as you can slightly justify what you're doing with all of this, I think it works out fine. Okay, uh, last one, moss. So as I've said before, obviously moss goes hand in hand with water. So the areas where you have water are the areas where the moss is first going to accumulate. And then also in lots of the reference I had, the moss was sort of present in these long stripes along each plank. So that's sort of what I was going for over here. Keep in mind that um, we do have the vertex painted moss inside engine. So this mask isn't supposed to give you any sort of like volumetric or like um, moss that sort of uh, has normals and stuff like that. This is kind of just like the moss that would first form and it's not really fully coalesced yet. Cool, so now that we have our masks generated, uh, what we want to do is we want to export these to UE4 to use with our shader. Now, the problem is we don't really want to spend a ton of time like packing all these channels inside Photoshop or whatever, exporting them one by one and then having to pack them. So I've quickly set up a output template, which I think works pretty well for all of this mask creation so it's just called a Cairo RGBA mask so essentially because I set up a base which is black and then all of my different channels 
they're just referring to the base color so they're not transmitting any roughness or any other type of information so you can just straight up um export your base color to the rgmb channels and then the engine will be able to unpack those separately for the alpha channel where the MOS is, I've just set this up to use the opacity. Now, this does require you to create the opacity channel inside Painter, but I think that's a little bit easier than maybe creating four user-defined input maps and having to set those up every time. At least your base color is always there, and you can always use it as masks. So in order to get that opacity working for the alpha, you just have to go to your channels, and just click on an opacity map which i think i've already set up so it's missing over there there we go opacity so you can see that what you, when you enable the opacity you now get that extra option over there so you just need to make sure that for your moss the opacity is set to one and it should match this over here so keep in mind before you export your masks you'll want to turn off this color over here because if you keep this color on, this is still a, this is still base color. So it's going to basically add this to your red, green, and blue masks. So you want to avoid that. Like I said, you can set up your own like custom output templates, which make things easier for you as long as you get everything into the right channel. So you would go ahead, you would export this at the resolution that your modeling package told you so whichever gets you a pretty decent texel density so this is a pretty big asset it's nearly nearly nine meters so 2k seems okay it's grayscale so it's not going to be too big so you would just go ahead and you would export that and then you would get it inside unreal and it would look something like this so when you import it it's going to import as default but because we don't intend on using sRGB, we don't need any color information, we can change this to masks because we only want to use the RGB and alpha channels individually as grayscale textures. So if we take a look at this, you can see that we have our color variation, dirt, wetness, and the moss. So, I think what I can do now is I can quickly show you how the how the shader works and then we can go about how it's set up. Okay. So we have texture parameters for all of our trim sheets. So I've just uh, packed this into diffuse and opacity and then metallic roughness, uh, occlusion and height, and then a normal. And then you have the mask, which drives the specific, the specific asset that you are looking at. So as you can see from here, the instance has controls over each of the masks. And then we also have controls for vertex mask, which I can just turn off at the moment. So uh, like I said, I think in the reference, I had this really nice uh, blue variation to the wood. So if I wanted to change that to something less saturated and maybe more bright, I can do that. And that's being driven by the mask. And then I also have a power parameter so that can be adjusted separately. Pretty much the same thing goes for all of the other masks that I've created over here. Uh, so for the dirt, we can bump that power up beyond two. So you can sort of set ranges where you can find where these things are going to act as they should and where they're going to get too overpowering and you can clamp those if you want to and then lastly there's stuff like wetness which i'll go through when i go uh, into setting up the shader but this one just essentially darkens the albedo also have controls for stuff like roughness which maybe you can't see over here let's get a spotlight there So your control over how rough or not that water is going to affect your surface. And obviously, the more intense the mask, the more this is going to affect that. Cool.
So there's a couple of other options over here, which I'll go through inside the master materials. So let's get into that. So this is pretty much it. It's not too complicated. Um, Paul, actually, if the students would like this to be made available to them, I don't mind sending it to you or posting it on our station for free or something, if you'd like that. That would be amazing, Cairo. Um, yep, please. No, no problem. So um, easiest way to work our way through this, just so that you understand it, is probably from left to right, left to right, you know, designer style. So on the left over here, we have all of the different, you know, the normal options that you have to set up for your material. So I'm using a mast material over here because I have some opacity inside my trim for the floaters and the nails and stuff like that. So that's why I've set the material to mast. Uh, interesting little quick tip, which I actually only found out the other day is obviously a mast or a translucent material is going to be more expensive than your normal opaque one, but you don't have to set all of your assets to mast. So even though the mast material is mast, in each inside each uh, material instance, there's also material property overrides sort of hidden at the bottom over here. So say for example, I know that this wall doesn't have any floaters and I know that it doesn't have any subsurface or anything like that. So I could theoretically go in, change that to a, opaque and change that to default lit. So it just helps you get a little bit more finer control over the optimization side of things, just in case you'd like to do that. There's also a two-sided option over here. So you can see that I don't have two-sided enabled by default inside my mask material. However, I just need to go into my instance for the thatch where I am using two-sided and just select it like that. Okay, sorry, I got sidetracked. Um, cool. So base trim setup, like you saw in the instance, this is just our diffusing opacity and all the other different texture parameter inputs. So this is basically what determines which UV channel the mesh is going to look inside for you. So I know in Blender, we had the unique in the first UV channel and the trim in the second. So you might be a little bit confused as to why it says one over here. Basically, UE4 starts counting at zero. So this is still the second UV channel, even though it says one. You can see over here in my RGBA mask, we have the texture coordinate index set to zero. So that's all going to be set up as you need. And then also, because we've unwrapped the trim, so that it works we don't really need to worry about tiling and the same goes with the mask pretty much that's inside the zero to one space so you don't need to worry about tiling pretty much at all using this method so if you look over here where the masks are affecting our diffuse our roughness and our normal you can see that i have obviously various different scalar parameters which are driving the instances and then i also have material parameter collections uh, which I'll go over a bit later when we get to them. So it's pretty straightforward how I've set up all of these masks to affect your assets. Um, basically, I'm just using simple lips for everything because it seems to work just fine for what I intended. I don't really need the uh, the masks to have access to height information from the trim or anything like that. It's not that fancy. But this seems to work pretty well because of the mask we generated inside Painter. So first of all, over here, a link to our red channel of the mask. We have a scalar parameter, which is just the color variation power. Now, you could potentially, for this, use a cheap contrast node, which would allow you to control the influence of said mask. But because I'm quite specific about how I go about creating the mask inside Painter, I don't really worry about that. Um, and also, in this specific environment, contrast tends to get a little bit too harsh too quickly. And like I said, I like to, to uh, blur some of the masks just to avoid that. 
So I'm pretty comfortable just using a multiply for this and pretty much all of the other diffuse, um, all the changes over there. So it's pretty simple. Um, your base trim goes into A, your color variation parameter, which we can change in the instance, goes into B, and then this goes into alpha. Pretty much exactly the same thing with the dirt color, and this will go into that loop. The only difference here is the dirt is going to affect the roughness. So you're basically just using a lot of loops over here. I've basically set up so that this is the roughness for the trim, and then it's going to add a certain amount to that. I think 0.7 is probably a bit high. Uh, that's going to white out all your roughness values. So probably bump that down to a lower value. I think I have it set at like 0.2, 0.3, something like that, just so that your base roughness can sort of shine through. Uh, and then going back up here to your wetness. So um, obviously, wet objects don't have a specific color. They sort of reflect the base properties of your trim in this case, or tileable, or whatever the case may be. So instead of using a specific color over here, I'm just darkening the material using a simple subtract. I believe when like photogrammetry artists and stuff like that, when they when they have to do this, I think they square the albedo. So um, if I were to try something like that, it looks something like this, um, which I feel is just a little bit too saturated for what I'm looking for. So after this, I would probably have to add a desaturation node. So I think in this case, it was just a little bit easier for me to subtract from the albedo with itself, basically. So probably not going to use one. I think in my final instances, I have around 0.1. And that seems to get a pretty good result. So if I just quickly open up this instance again, so you can see that we have the wetness darkening factor over here. So obviously this would reduce, crush all your values back down to black. So just play around with that value and you'll get something that looks pretty natural. Okay, back to this. Now we have the MOS color, uh, which is multiplied by the MOS power, very similar to the other ones. And the reason why this is a parameter is just it's just easy for like quality of life stuff. If you ever decide to change your um, MOS tileable, anything like that, it's just really easy to come back in here and change that hue. Going back to roughness, we have a lerp, which directly lerps the roughness of the trim with the dirt. And then you can just set a wetness roughness, which I thought was a little bit easier than subtracting and trying to have to work out um, that it's not going below zero or anything like that. Pretty much the same thing with the moss. I sort of uh, eyeballed this just to get it pretty much the same as the tileable. And then that takes us to the static switch parameter we have over here. So now this, I think, is especially useful for optimization because pretty much my entire scene is using the second UV workflow, but there are also areas where it's not, for example, this thatch. So if I open up this material instance over here, you can see I've used that static switch parameter to just turn off the, uh, the RGBA mask functionality so that it's not so expensive. So if I just go into shader complexity quickly, you get something like this. So, I mean, overall, the second UV workflow is not terrible for optimization, but if you're sort of fighting for any frames you can get, uh, it might just be a good idea just to, anything that doesn't need the second UV, you can just turn it off. Okay. So as long as you have this static switch parameter and the same one with the same name is applied to all of your changes for the diffuse, the roughness, and the normal, it's going to work pretty well. Then for the false input for the RGBA mask, it's just leading back to your base trim. So it's as if your second UV changes never happened. Um, Paul, would you like me to go through the vertex mask blending or? Yeah, if you have time, please, yeah, that would be good. Cool. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so the master is pretty interesting because I've just created a function for this, just cre keep things a, a little bit more tidy, stuff like that. So probably the first thing you'll notice about the moss, which I think is useful for a lot of things, especially inside UE4, is the fuzzy shading grass shader, or node rather. So what this does is basically it sort of bends light around your, your mesh, sort of like this. You can sort of see that the inside is a little bit darker than the outside kind of like a Fresnel, but it's a little bit more useful. And because we have the inputs for diffuse, edge color, and normal, which actually I can actually plug in that normal. So it'll just bend light a little bit more accurately. It makes things a little bit, look a little bit fuzzier, more like mass in this case. So now this sort of relates back to the second UV workflow. So this is our second channel where our trim is stored. So everything inside our trim, according to our unwrap over here, is the same texel density. So that's why I decided to tile the moss using this um, coordinate index, because everything is the same texel density. So you don't have to worry about your moss being slightly different scales, uh, depending on your unique unwrap. So it just makes life a little bit easier. So that's the actual MOS setup, but now let's talk about uh, setting up the blend. So obviously with the vertex color, we want to have some control over how much it's blending and it uh, sort of needs to blend with respect to the height and stuff like that. So this is a little tip I've picked up uh, from some, some artists and stuff like that. So basically we're going to use a height loop and that height loop is going to drive our alphas for the MOS loop. So from the material function, we have all of our outputs. So basically, just because I'm a big dummy, um, I like to put moss into green because moss is green. And um, so basically, every mesh you import from Blender, at least, this could be different from different uh, for different softwares, uh, the vertex colors are going to be white, meaning that the red, green, and blue channels have all been painted in, so to speak. So I sort of just um, set a one minus X node over there so that you can subtract the green. I'll show you in a minute how I do that. So now this is the, this is the part where it actually makes the blending look quite realistic. So basically, we have a height texture for our moss. And you'll need a height texture for your blending if you want this to work pretty effectively. So basically, we want to create contrast inside of that height so that we can determine um, how it's going to blend with your surface. Because if you look at the height over here, it's okay, there's some areas of dark and there's some contrast, but we want to be able to play around with that so that only the highest areas of the mass obviously show up. So that's why we're using this lerp to create contrast. So basically we set an an arbit sort of arbitrary value of negative 10 into A, and then we use the B value as our parameter, and this default is set to 10. So now if I preview this, you can see that this has given the, the mask quite a bit more contrast, so this is how it's going to vertex paint when you do that. So if I were to change this to something around 5, which I think it is for the majority of my scene, you get something like this. So it's basically just raising and lowering the cutoff point at the bottom over here. So it works pretty well. So into the transition phase goes your vertex color. Um, after the loop, you just want to clamp your values between zero and one, because if you have your height map below that or above that, it's gonna give you some weird shit. Um, so yeah, that goes into your height texture. Uh, the height loop does come with this default contrast, but I don't find it as effective as me this method, but so you can, can play around with either of the two. Cairo, okay. where does the value, sorry to interrupt you, where does the value of 10 come from? It's pretty arbitrary. It's sort of like a ratio. So I could make this negative one and this one, and it'll give me exactly the same thing. Okay. So... Now, if I just want to get the same results before, I'll just have to make that negative one, uh, sorry, 0.5, more or less. 
So it's, it's, it's that's why I say it's pretty arbitrary. So okay. you could make this uh, a percentage, you could make it a decimal, whatever you want, really. Got it. Cheers. So, like I said, um, all of that is contributing towards this height loop. And then that's going to be the alpha, which drives all of your different mosses. So those are pretty standard. They're just going to go into all of your default parameters over there. And then the final thing over here is just the subsurface scattering. So this is where material parameter co collections come into play. And um, I said I wanted to touch on this a little bit more. So basically if you've never heard of them the difference between a material parameter collection is it will affect all of those instances across your scene no matter what the the values are inside the material instances and stuff like that so anything that i want constant across the scene i'll put inside a material parameter collection anything that i want to kind of vary from asset to asset i'll put inside a scalar parameter so let me just show you how this works quickly. So I have it over here, material parameter collection. So basically how it works is you can set up scalar or vector parameters pretty similar to the material editor itself. So I wanted a way to control my overall second channel mask power, and then also stuff like moss scattering, puddle normals, thatch scattering, moss normals, stuff like that. So if I drag this over here, this is going to affect all of my assets pretty much at the same time. Not too sure how clearly you guys can see that, but it's there. So basically how you go about setting this up, oh God, no. How you go about setting this up is you just go into materials and you create a material parameter collection, and then you'll just have to add different scalars or vectors depending on what you want. And then it's pretty much as easy as just dragging this into your material editor. And then you just select from the drop down whichever the scalars or the vectors you've created. So it's pretty useful for when you want changes to be done globally instead of having to worry about doing it either through the material editor or through tons and tons of instances. Uh, so, last thing over here. So as I was saying uh, before I got distracted by that, this is why I have the thatch scattering intensity and the moss scattering intensity as material per, uh, collection parameters instead of scalars and stuff like that. So the last little switch I have over here is just use subsurface for diffuse. So basically when I want to use the same moss material for thatch, I just have something like this, which I can click that on and then instead of only having subsurface scattering on the moss, I'll have it all over. So quickly before I forget, let me just show you how that blend contrast for the moss works. So that's probably the easiest to do it here. So like all vertex painting, you do need actual verts for this to work well, but I found that you need significantly less than maybe you would with other mes methods. Uh, so like I said, I'm just going to untick everything except green. And then we, because we put in that one minus X node, we're actually going to be painting with black essentially. So I want more moss over here. So we're going to do something like that. Then you can just go into your material instance for this specific asset. I actually wanted to change the moss tiling for that. So now we have all these vertex moss parameters, which are either drawn from the material function or from our main material. So here's the blend contrast. So we can play around with that. And as you can see, it's pretty good at adhering to the height to make it look how you want. So it's really nice for um, maybe times when you need less heavy moss, sort of at higher places, and then heavier moss at wetter places. So let me just take one final look at here to see if there's anything I've forgotten. Oh yeah, so one last thing is just the normal. So this is another parameter collection. So I just wanted to flatten the normal a little bit where the wet mask is applied. 
but also only where there's excessive wetness. So essentially the logic behind this is when there's a good puddle over there. So basically when you have the water being applied to the surface, the, the normal is going to be flattened a little bit just to allow for better reflections. Because as you know, wood is quite noisy. So it does sort of disrupt from some of those nice reflections that you might want. So this is also a material parameter coll collection. So I can just play around with this and you can see this is basically the wood as it is in, in the normal map in the trim. And then I've set it to something like this just so that it catches the lights a little bit better. Cool. I think that's uh, pretty much the shader setup. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions if anybody's got. So. That's a, a really impressive shader. Very, very cool the way you've implemented different things. I, I haven't heard of uh, material parameter collections before. Um, so that's, I can see a use for that for sure. So that's like a global parameter, essentially, Cairo? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, so that if you want anything to change across the whole scene, just plug it in there. Pretty cool. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, the first one actually is relating to Blender. Um, as I'm sure you may have no may have sort of gathered from my Twitter, I'm 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 currently le learning uh, Blender. Uh, that Texel density tool, what what is that that you're using there to check? Um, it's, Texel it's density checker. Pixel checker. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's free. I can actually I'll send you the link after this. Okay. And yeah, do you unwrap in Blender? Yeah, I unwrap. Um, it depends. Like all of this stuff is pretty much planks and cylinders yeah so it's not really much of a problem to unwrap here so if it was something more complicated i'd probably go with like ryzen something like that but okay. for this auto packs pretty much the way to go okay and in painter if you just don't mind going back into uh you see your green channel so um, that just confused me so why have you got um two like two elements to your green mask let me show you quickly. Um, so, so, so I was using the uh, the Moss Builder, that pretty generic mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that one is if I take away the subtract, uh, like I said, it, it's not really like, it doesn't really take scale into account. So things sort of get overpowered. And also you're not going to get such like crazy AO dirt over here. Mm -hmm. So I wanted that level everywhere else except there. So I just subtracted that and just made one with a bit less levels. Got you. Okay. Dude, that's so cool. It's such a... Yeah, it's a really cool workflow. Yeah. It's really cool even the way that Paul was showing me um, using the user um, defined... Yeah, like, for the masks. Features. Yeah. Um, it's insane to see that you could just do it through RGB that way as well. Without using user ones, I yeah, just create a really preset cool. using the users. Um, Cairo, is does it matter like what what green it is? I'm blue and red in Painter. To do that, does it have to be a certain value? Yeah, so you just want to make sure it's pretty much completely oh, red, okay. green or blue. Yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha. I mean, you could do some pretty interesting things if you like mix those up a bit, but then you'd have to like mm -hmm. think deep, think deep about which masks you want mixing and mm. yeah. How would you um, go about like previewing that that you know that it's what you want? Uh, I was actually going to mention this, but it uh, seemed a little bit like complicated even in my head. So let me. So what you can actually do is hmm, let me bring up Designer quickly. So designer their bakers actually do have support for uv channels so what i did for one of these trims was you can basically bake your trim onto the asset so basically it'll take all of this information over here look at how it's applied on your unique unwrap over here and then do do its best to sort of match that. So obviously you're not going to get great textile density or anything, but it's just it could be good as like a preview tool. You could just basically uh, mm. put it at at the bottom of the stack over there, 
And then you'll also have like really cool features like you could bake out the curvature of your trim, the height, the ambient occlusion, all those normal like mesh maps, you could bake those out. And then um, stuff like your mask could actually like adhere based on the height and the curvature and stuff like that. Um, so it is a pretty cool way to go about it and it'll, you'll definitely get cool results. Um, I just don't know if it's like worth the time investment to bake out every single asset. Yeah. One of the things about this workflow seems to be the the speed, like how, mm. how quickly you can <clears throat> get materials down, uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah. a good way to check, I guess. Uh, mm. Does anyone have any questions? And sorry, just on Steve's thing of, about like visualizing stuff, you could you can set up your masks using like RGB and stuff, and then like okay, I know this is going to be sort of this color in engine, uh, this sort of roughness. So you can sort of visualize like that as well. Uh, just have like maybe like duplicate layers, stuff like that. Awesome. Like I said, it's it's so quick to like export masks back and forth that you can really do this in like a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a question about the collections again. Uh, it was yeah. something again. I I'm not, I wasn't aware of it either. But whenever you create that, does that just mean those nodes are automatically within? The material editor you don't have to like um touch anything bit, or do it you? is a bit a bit weird because like i i've only like recently started using these as well so you can't so like for example if i go back into the master it's weird because there's no like material parameter collection in over here so the only way to actually get these in is to drag and drop which seems oh, a right. bit weird but hey hmm. Yeah, so it's basically just a case of drag it into the material you want it, select the parameter you want, and uh, yeah, you're good to go. Cool. Cheers. I know it can be sometimes weird with certain blueprints that are made, and you have to attach it to the blueprint to actually see the references oh, yeah. to it and stuff. So I was just checking if that was the same. Yeah. No, luckily, it seems to be like pretty easy to use. Thanks. There will probably be lots of questions after you leave Cairo. This is the usual, the usual student approach to questioning, you know, ask yeah, when the person's gone. <laughs> um, too far of being a student myself, I know. Okay. Well, you can relate <laughs> then. Um, but that, that's going to be super useful for us, man. Like, um, a couple of these guys are 100% wanting to, to utilize something like this in their, in their sort of final portfolio pieces. So, um, I think this, the insight you provided is, is, is phenomenal and even one, just one your shader question, setup actually. is really good. <laughs> sure, Steve. Yeah, go. Um, seeing the, um, I think it's the second trim one. It's the one with the ambient occlusion and stuff. Your height, uh, it's some, it's something that I haven't really used a lot. Was it that one height? Yeah. What would you use the height for? Um. So I actually don't have a use case in this example, but you okay. could, you could implement it so that this blend or rather slurp with the moss was sort of um integrated with that height um that's something i'd planned to do initially but now uh, seeing the results with the moss i don't know if it's worth that extra like mm -hmm. cost would that like require tessellation or something for the height to work or not necessarily tessellation no. i mean i mean you could just um how would i go about this so at the moment, the vertex painting is probably where I would use this just to get a better blend between yeah. the moss and the... Yeah, I mean, like, let me sh show you what this height map looks like. So it looks pretty much something like this. So my wood is like, there's not much variation in it. And all mixing this with the moss would do is make the moss show up in like these really, really like narrow crevices. Mm -hmm which like wouldn't look good. So I'll work out a use case for it. <laughs> cool. Cool, man. Thank you so uh, much, Cairo. That was, that was yeah. amazing, man. Yeah, that was awesome. Stop recording. Cool.